Okay, I've been waiting to do a commentary on this film for a long time. It would have come up sooner, but I lost my copy when my hard drive crashed, so I had to re-download it and grab uh, another copy of it. This is uh, Lois Weber's uh, 1915 classic, Hypocrites. Lois Weber is probably one of the greatest directors in Hollywood history. She started out as an actress and became a screenwriter and director. And her films, before anyone else was doing any kind of uh, social issues and social commentary in films, Lois Weber was the first one to make really serious and really meaningful films. Because of this film, it has some nude, nude scenes in it, some nudity in it, and other, some of her other films have issues that would catch the eye of the censors, and she was always a, a favorite target of the censorship bureau of, for films in the in the US. Anyway, this this particular film is probably or possibly one of the if if not the best one of the best films she ever made and it has some really important things to say and hopefully I will try and cover as many of them as possible as I'm doing this commentary. Normally when I make these commentaries, it's a struggle to find enough things to talk about to fill up all the time, but I have a feeling with this film I'm going to run out of time before I get through everything that really needs to be said with this film. So anyway, for, for Christians or any, anyone who believes in the Bible, this film, like Body and Soul, is a must-see because there are some things that are said in here that anyone who, who believes the Bible needs to, uh, needs to see this film. From the opening scenes, uh, we can see that Lois Weber liked to use a lot of double exposures which the Ten Commandments, uh, DeMille's Ten Commandments, also uses a lot of double exposure, but Lois Weber uses it for a different effect, and from about 36 seconds in the intro, she uses it to introduce the characters, and one, especially one of the characters, uh, who we will talk about later, appears only in double exposure for uh, reasons that will be uh, explained later. Just for interest's sake, the... Uh, section of the Bible that Pastor Gabriel, will call him, is uh, referring to in, in his sermon on hypocrisy. Matthew 23 is a section where Jesus addresses the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. So this is a very fitting scripture reference for uh, the subject matter of this film. Suffice it to say that this is the type of sermon that would make almost every church member uncomfortable. And sure enough, we see before even three minutes into the film, probably all the wealthier members of the congregation are already uh, looking very angry and dissatisfied. Even the choir looks like they hate the message. The only ones who aren't offended are the uh, two who aren't paying attention. They're reading the newspaper behind the pulpit. And keep that uh, newspaper picture in mind because it's going to come back in a few minutes here in the next, the next part of the story. Weber not only directed this film, but she wrote this script herself. And it has a lot of beautiful symbolism and uh, almost like uh, metaphor and parables similar to uh, Jesus' teaching in the Bible. The screenplay of this film, I think, is really exceptionally good because 
it moves along at the fastest pace that it possibly can and still tell the story and there's no slow parts or wasted scenes so Weber did an extremely good job of, of writing this story. This, this film is an art film with a lot of important things to say. At about almost six minutes, we see the real first instance of hypocrisy where the probably the president or of the uh, church board congratulates Pastor Gabriel for his great message. And then we will see exactly what he thinks of this great message when he talks to his wife in private. <laughs> Oops, I've already mixed up a part of the movie. What I should have said or what I meant to say is that we've already seen what the banker here thought of this sermon when he was uh, complaining to his wife while Pastor Gabriel was preaching. We couldn't hear what he was saying, but we sure could see his facial expression, which did not at all look like he approved of uh, anything Gabriel was saying. Less than a minute later into the film, we see the inf informal church board meeting <laughs> in which the same wealthy member of the church who congratulated Gabriel is the one now demanding his resignation, but of course he wants his name kept out of it. This actually reminds me of something that happened in a real church, in a church I attended, in which the pastor was had all these outreach programs and they were doing a lot of good and he was... It was really reaping a, a good harvest, and uh, yet the board members uh, turned on him and fired him. And again, anyway, just in case uh, you're, you're thinking, oh, this would never happen in real life. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> in the case of this, uh, this real pastor, he's somebody I, I had known for over 30 years, uh, and he was really listening to God at the time. He was spending a lot of time alone with God in prayer and seeking a lot of directions, and I thought the things he was doing was all extremely good ideas that must have come from God. And again, yet the, the board members and the people of the church paid him back with getting, by getting rid of him. <laughs> he may have wanted God and more, more of God in his life, but the rest of the church wanted none of it. And I think that is applicable here in this, uh, in this film too. The last film that I made a commentary for uh, right before this one was Body and Soul, another classic, classic Christian film with a big message and a lot of important things to say. But it was it actually, in a way, it's the uh, inverse, the opposite of this film. Because in this film, here the Reverend is probably the most sincere person in the film, and whereas his congregation is not not interested in God, and whereas uh, Body and Soul was about a, a, a corrupt pastor and an honest congregation who had been deceived. I think in the Body and Soul film, one of the things the director was pointing out is that the modern church really lacks discernment. In the case of today's church, we have a epidemic of false prophets and false teachers, like such as the disease of televangelists that's uh, spreading all over the airwaves, and yet... It seems very few people can tell the true from the false. Most of all, I just wish that the, all these, these people, all these deceived uh, church members would just stop sending the televangelists money so they, could, so they wouldn't be able to buy their private jets and mansions anymore. Okay, here at about 9 minutes and almost 10 seconds, the Pastor Gabriel finds the uh, newspaper that the two young guys behind his, uh, his pulpit were reading. And he now catches a glimpse of the vintage, the, the old painting that's on the cover of the paper, which uh, it depicts the truth as a, as a naked woman. And this something in him must have sparked something in his imagination because it sets him off in a different direction, I think, than where, probably where he started when he woke up in the morning planning to convict the, the congregation of all their hypocrisy. For whatever reason, his maybe his his lack of distractions at this time in the in the events of the film, and maybe his his mental state, 
both contribute to a change, a big change in perspective, or signal a big change in perspective from uh, Reverend Gabriel, where he may have started out thinking just focused on uh, hypocrisy, and he, he now is almost like he's ready to uh, try and grasp or try and, and reach for something bigger. Now, Gabriel might be looking at his job as the spiritual leader of this church from the perspective of being only outwardly focused and using doing things to maybe challenge and convict the uh, the parishioners. Here it almost seems his, his whole life is taken over and puts him on a quest. It may be here that this is the first time in his life that he is now really seeking intimacy with God. A little later we see as Gabriel falls asleep, he now begins to dream about the contents of the, the painting that he saw and his, his subconscious, I think, begins to start thinking about perhaps a, some kind of a quest for the truth. I think here he starts to dream about being out in, alone in nature, perhaps because a lot, of, a lot of us, the natural tendency for people is we think if we go on a nature hike, mountains or somewhere away from a lot of the city or world distractions, we could better hear from God. And I think this might be what's Gabriel's intention. One of the things I, I like this that I like that this film shows in Reverend Gabriel, Pastor Gabriel's symbolic search for truth that he sort of embarks on here is that it reminds me a lot of John 8.31 in which Jesus says, If you hold on to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. As the story progresses, we will see here who, in this case, who really wants to be made free by the truth. Sooner has he decided he wants to perhaps climb the symbolic mountain to see what's at the top. Several members of his congregation now appear in his dream and they start to follow his lead, which is maybe subconsciously what he was hoping would happen in the uh, as he preached the, the sermon Sunday morning on hypocrisy. Here we uh, see the banker from the previous scene in which he, he basically uh, tells the board to uh, fire uh, Gabriel. And this character is probably president of the city's largest bank. And he probably only attends church to make business deals, get his uh, permission to sin by following the meaningless uh, human religious rituals, and to be seen by others as important. This character kind of shows some of the futility and the ridiculousness of, of human religion and, uh, and man's um, empty and meaningless rituals. And I think in looking at this uh, church on this congregation, they would probably be happier with a, a motivational speaker instead of someone who is going to try and challenge them to real faith or, or preach the actual word out of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 15 and verses 6 to 9, and Jesus talks about uh, how humans love to cancel out the, the word of God by our, our own meaningless traditions, in which he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And here he's quoting Isaiah from the Old Testament. But it shows you that human nature has not changed over thousands of years. Here, by this point, uh, Gabriel seems to be completely taken over by his new quest for the truth. However, it seems as in life, most of the members of his congregation are too interested in other things to follow him up the path. And at 14 minutes and 11 seconds, Weber puts up a good quote from the Gospels, referring to Jesus and, and the narrow way in Matthew Matthew 7.13, in case any of you want to look it up. Especially the man who looks up the mountain pathway and laughs and then walks away. These are all the people who are too busy with their lives to actually live their faith. Apparently, these are all the uh, foolish virgins from uh, Matthew chapter 25, uh, verses 1 to 12. At least here we see Gabriel is re determined to uh, climb to the top of the mountain and, and find the truth. End of part 1.